Okay, I'm, uh, for those who don't know me, I, I'm Noam from uh, Excel, Microsoft. And I'm gonna talk about how we tackle the problem. How, what is our thinking about responsiveness in the app? Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna share how using event timing API for that. I'm gonna show kind of the, some of the use cases and challenges we have and maybe ideas to address them. Uh, for those who are not familiar, so um, Excel for the web, it's the uh, web client we have uh, at Microsoft for uh, Excel. You can uh, use Excel in the cloud, author documents, um, and so on. Uh, it is an SPA. It's a complex SPA with uh, lots of moving parts, tons of JavaScript, and everything else. So that just keep that in mind. And let's, let me start with what we're trying to achieve. So we, we actually want to improve interactivity. And I'm not going to talk about all aspects of interactivity. Uh, we talked about some of it uh, yesterday uh, regarding animation smoothness. And in, um, in Yoav's talk about uh, navigation uh, response time. And I'm actually going to talk about uh, more immediate uh, response. So be, before we do that, just want to share what we're currently using, the, the APIs that we have. We're relying on long task API so we can measure uh, long JavaScripts. And the main downside for that approach is that it's hard to get attribution, uh, what actually causing long tasks and also it's hard to um, to determine the actual uh, user experience in terms of when things got rendered. It's only about JavaScript task execution. Uh, the second approach that uh, is commonly used is using request animation frame loop. Um, the challenge here, the, the, there are actually several challenges listed. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I think the, the main problem with this approach is that it does not, it's only triggered we, to, to conserve uh, user battery and CPU. Um, we only trigger it uh, once the user starts interacting. So we actually miss the interaction start uh, of any um, user input and uh, some other uh, problems. So, we start thinking about what are the goals for a responsiveness metric if you're trying to de define it or articulate it. And we want to be as accurate as possible and stable so it would not fluctuate. And we want to be able to use it for regression detection, know um, what is the responsiveness of specific user, user action and not just any random uh, user input in our app. We want to use it as an um, metric so we can use inside the organization as an internal metric so we can uh, follow it and um, and so on so we started by creating some uh, definitions we start with user action which is the thing we hope to get responsiveness um, information and the definition for user action is any interaction with a UI element that we expect a response in the UI. Okay, uh, that's most of the interactions uh, expect response, but not all of them. So that's what we call user action. It should be clicking on a certain button in the UI or um, mouse down or keyboard events and, and so on. So that's what we define as user action. Uh, second definition would be um response time and that would be um the time it took for the user action until we showed some meaningful response it's essentially the next frame and some people can see it's already aligned pretty well with uh, event timing uh, and the Last definition is responsive user action, which essentially is every user action that has a response time with that's below 100 millisecond because above that user starts feeling uh, lag in the UI. 
And that's just an illustration uh, what we mean with response time. Um, uh, for example, clicking, uh, doing like mouse down on a grid. So after less than 100 milliseconds, we want to show the selection of where the user clicked. So taking from the diagram that um, uh, Nicholas usually shows, uh, this is like a simplification of it in terms of only the event timing API uh, related aspects. And you, you can see that uh, from the time a user uh, start, the start time indicates when the user uh, does the input and the full duration is actually the response time that we are interested in measuring. And there are several other uh, parts when we are uh, using event timing. Uh, we can determine the input delay uh, based on the processing start. And we can turn, we can determine how long it took the event handlers to process. And we know there is a remaining time that uh, other async tasks and the rendering can happen. And that impacts the full response time. Um, the API is what we're using is the performance observer observer. We observe the events with 400 millisecond uh, responses. And I'd like to, to pay attention to an important aspect of the spec, which we take advantage of for this. And notice that the performance timing entry has a start time, which uh, according to the spec associated to the event timestamp which is when the user uh, input actually happened. So how we take advantage of that fact? Uh, for every user action that we are interested in uh, measuring, we use add event uh, listener with the event, uh, in this example, some element. And then we call um, like a global function that we created, pass it the event and a string that represents the user action. Now, the challenge here that we're trying to address is how to correlate between the user action, which is represented by the event and the string, and the performance uh, event timing entry. And we do that by storing the events in a map uh, using the, the event type and timestamp as keys. And we just store the user action. It is a, actually a simplification what actually happening behind the scene, but it's sufficient for, for the explanation. Now, when we process the event timing entries uh, in the observer callback, we uh, basically match the uh, entry uh, start time with the event uh, timestamp that we got. And we also can match the, the event type and, or event time. Um, yeah, so that's about that. And after that, we can uh, log the information and aggregate it and uh, update any counters that we'd like to report on. And that's maybe an example of, uh, of, of a simplified log. We have, for every action, we have some uh, total count of how many times the action happens and how many slow actions uh, we uh, detected. So now that we have this metric for, or this measurement of slow actions, it's not really a responsiveness metric we can uh, rate our app. Uh, so we start by defining what's a responsive session. And uh, we, we took a uh, definition of 90% of all actions in a session are responsive. I'm not gonna go into what a session means. It's probably uh, specific to uh, any app, how they define uh, what a user session is. But essentially, it's a, I guess, a certain flow that the user interacts with the application that has a start and an end. And then uh, we define responsiveness as uh, what is the rate of responsive sessions uh, that we have over time. Um, so, and I put an example chart that you can see that what we found that the, using this uh, responsive metric is very stable and it's uh, sensitive enough to detect any regression uh, when you introduce uh, new code or um, other um, aspects of changes to your application. Um, and 
we are working towards making this like uh, an official responsiveness uh, metric in the app. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the challenges uh, we have, and some of them I, um, some of them may, some of you may have noticed them. Uh, the, and this is a list. I'm probably not going to go over all of them, but uh, the list here is by order of importance based on my uh, thinking. And the hardest part with this API is uh, integrated. Uh, as you notice, the integration is manual. You have to, uh, for each event handler, um, inject a JavaScript call to a function. Um, and you want to ensure that when developers inject it or add this, it's added to a synchronous part of the event handler. So if the event handler is calling an asynchronous part, it's not guaranteed that the tracking would happen um, as part of the um, uh, the same frame, right? Because the, the callback could uh, run later. Uh, some idea is, Oh, and, and another thing is you want to make sure that it's inside an event handler that actually modifies the DOM or part of the process. It could be other event handlers that modify the DOM as part of the sequence, and that's fine, but uh, it shouldn't be as part of any event handler that doesn't cause any, any flow of event handlers that doesn't cause any DOM modification because that means we're not really measuring the response time. I'm thinking maybe we can add, if there is an option to add some indication about the DOM status, that might help to determine that. Um, but um, I'm not sure if that's uh, the best approach. The second hardest problem is how we how, how would we correlate the DOM input events with the event timing entries? Ideally, we wouldn't have to do that. Ideally, you would be able to just um, track the user action somehow, and then immediately, without storing it or doing some uh, complex matching logic, know what um, the responsiveness of that um, input, user input. Uh, some ideas here is maybe adding some event ID um, that uh, either auto-generated or can be set somehow to both uh, DOM event and performance uh, timing, event timing entry. Uh, another idea that would uh, eliminate the need for uh, doing like a function call um, is using um, maybe tags on the DOM event that would propagate somehow to the event timing uh, entry. Um, I don't know. Maybe there are other ideas. Other uh, challenges, uh, the event timing API doesn't uh, support scroll yet, not in the spec and not in the, any implementation. And that has been discussed previously. Um, hopefully that uh, makes progress because it would uh, allow us to uh, understand scrolling responsiveness much better. Another problem is uh, analyzing, an analyzing the uh, timing gaps. Um, so once we have uh, an indication of a slow uh, response, it's not always clear not what's blocking. Now, if it's uh, input delay, we know it's blocked by maybe some tasks. We're not sure if it's, we know if it's a uh, long event handler uh, processing time, but we don't know what comes after that. Is it like a lot of async JavaScript tasks? Is it GC? Is it um, rendering? Um, complexity that takes a lot of time, um, yeah, and, and so on. So any more attribution or indication of what's actually causing uh, the gaps that are not exposed with event timing uh, would be helpful. Uh, the uh, Another aspect is correlating the event timing entry with the hidden, hidden page states. It's always a problem. Um, we want to understand that when we had a slow event, it was related to a page visibility change. And that's uh, sometimes it can be a challenge. Uh, in summary, uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure that uh, I think that uh, event timing API is very useful for measuring responsiveness, even with uh, some challenges that we have. 
I don't think it should block any progress or uh, hinder any uh, advancement of, uh, of that API. Um, we also thinking about integrating it with the JS uh, sub-profiling that uh, has been recently uh, released in Chromium um, and cross the event timing entries with records we get from JS self-profiling. So we'll get full attribution and allow us to do root cause analysis on slow uh, response uh, response time events. And uh, last but not the least is uh, be happy if other vendors would have a full support for uh, event timing API uh, so we could uh, have uh, better coverage for all our um, clients. Uh, that's all I had. If I uh, have thoughts or questions, comments, or if you want to follow up in more details, I'll be happy if you can uh, reach out. That's what I had. Okay, let me stop the recording.